All right, we're back for part three of Jarrett Walker's little presentation. So let's get going. Transit agency labor arrangement is that a bus driver should be able to have a home and a family and should be able to afford that. And, All right. and so we have to ask, is that what we want in the future? Or do we want to continue yeah. to develop a larger and larger workforce of people who can't afford yeah, it. I was just talking about this at the end of the last movie. What do we want? The bus driver should be have, able to have a home and a family. Yes. And also, people should be able to get rich, which nobody ever talks about. Why should McFarlane get to retire with $200,000 cash bonus when he decides to his last day? Fourteen, fifteen thousand $15,000 a month for life. But the bus drivers, they, should we give them a, yeah, well, let's give them a house and a, a regular life. Yeah. Uh -huh. that. I'm not saying Uber drivers or uh, Lyft drivers are necessarily all destitute. I talk to a lot of them, but they tend. I, I, I chat with them. I chat with Lyft drivers all the time when I'm using the service, and I'm struck by how few of them have children. I'm struck by how many of them have, are either pre-family formation or, or, or don't have children yet. You know why that is? Because Uber and Lyft are kind of like TriMet Mini Run. You can't. You can't have. You can't support a family on it, really, because it's not, it, first of all, it's not continuous. You never know if you're going to work or not. And then second of all, you don't make enough money. And the transit uh, TriMet mini runners are in the same boat. Uh, it used to be a long wait to become a full-time driver. The only reason I, I could stay mini run is because I was single. And I didn't have a family. I couldn't have done that if I had a family. Yeah. Or are older adults whose children are grown. Um, so there are limitations <laughs> to what you're providing for the society when you, when everything shifts to those sorts of jobs. And of course, anything that happens that moves people from larger vehicles into smaller ones, um, as may be happening with the 6% shift that this one study found, is of course meaning quite directly higher congestion, higher emissions, more need for road space, because we're moving people less efficiently in terms of the fundamental, unshakable reality of physical space. So roles for demand response, obviously it is already a higher end service for higher paying travelers, which is a perfectly fine thing for the private sector to be doing. Um, maybe it has roles for semi-fixed services doing suburban feeders, but still the case for subsidy is weak because it's still not nearly as productive as a terrible fixed rent. And by the way, when I make these claims, I should emphasize I'm not absolutely sure that they're not as productive as a fixed route. I know that I can't get any of these companies to show me that it is. These companies tend to be very secretive and, you know, as they're entitled to be, but those of us out in the public space... They tend to be very secretive, as is American public transportation districts and especially TriMet. ...trying to interpret what they're saying, you know, are entitled to suspect that if they were doing this well, they would tell us. <laughs> And that given that they're not making this, these kinds of announcements that, yes, they are matching fixed rate productivities, I think it's fair to assume, uh, or it's, it, it is all one can do to assume that they're probably not doing that. Um, so I think as we're all discovering, policy, government policy really needs to capture the impacts of these services. And in all the major cities now, Several places are ahead of Portland on this, um, particularly San Francisco, which has been dealing with this longer than anything. Anyone, they're starting to get very aggressive about regulating these services. A number of them have been busted for um, violations of various safety laws, uh, not Uber and Lyft, but the little startups. Actually, Uber, and Uber, I think Uber has gotten into some trouble too. But the bigger issue is just that um, it... All of the impacts, for example, curb space, constantly stopping in bus stops and keeping bus, you know, and, um, so that buses can't get into them, all that kind of stuff. Um, and just the overall impact of increasing VMT by shifting people from transit into these services um, has, has, is an area that government just has to be in because it's just chaos otherwise. Um, on the other hand, many transit agencies are feeling like they need to somehow get into this business, and my advice is no. I can't see right now why a transit agency should be getting into this business um, to the extent that uh, we've seen a few exper I've seen a few experiments, the famous bridge experiment, bridge, a company that is no longer with us, 
um, of the famous bridge experience it's in Kansas City, my understanding is that it achieved less than one morning per hour. One compared to 10, which is terrible for a fixed rate. Um, so, uh, and other cases I've seen where transit agencies have done little experiments, it's often very common, right? People are coming at transit agencies and saying, why don't you try it? What are you against trying it? Well, the answer is, we can do the math. We don't need to try it. But you don't, you don't often feel the confidence to say that, so you try it. So you go out and do a, do a trial. Lots of transit agencies have done this, you know. We haven't seen a big success. We've seen lots of PR about it. But, um, and we haven't seen a big success because the geometry kind of doesn't work. Uh, for that to really succeed, especially if you're going to do it in the context of a transit agency standard wage rates. So it's almost inevitable that if you're trying to make such an inefficient model succeed, you are going to have to push wage rates down. Um, and that, you know, that has all the other consequences that we've talked about. Now, where driverlessness really starts to change this is when we talk about the driverless car and the driverless bus. So, um, obviously, driverless rapid transit already exists. There have been driverless trains uh, running in Vancouver for over 30 years now, 31 years this year. Um, there are lots of driverless rapid transit systems. In fact, you've probably ridden them inside of airports in a lot of cities. Um, <clears throat> the driverless bus is happening. Um, lots of the press has been about adorable tiny buses in Europe, but the big driverless bus is happening. It's happening in China. And it's starting to happen through Mercedes in Europe and North America. Um, the, the, if, if automation comes along and is as successful and as smoothly accepted as its promoters encourage us to believe, and, and I think that's this still isn't even if there, but if that happens, then you're going to have, we're going to have to have the driverless bus. Because the nightmare scenario there is really cheap Uber and Lyft, because there aren't any drivers anymore, competing with transit that's bearing labor costs. And that, that, that will be a hopeless situation for transit. And as well, you know, this is all neoliberalism here because everything is being presented in the context of, of cost. And everything is presented in the context of how much can we save by not paying anybody. That's all pure neoliberalism here. The, the 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 whole the whole model is is wrong in my in my opinion. This shouldn't be about. I mean, when we look at the military, there's no such parameters. Okay, none. This is only being imposed because it helps people. Anything that benefits citizens has to be viewed from the neoliberal lens. Anything that benefits corporations or the elites does not have to be viewed through the neoliberal lens. And that's my biggest argument with everything that's going on around us right now in, in this country. We're being, we're being scammed because we're being told that we, we're not affordable. That's the citizens. We can't pay you. And uh, this, is why, this is why the civilization is going to crumble, in my opinion, because they're going to have all these buses and there's going to be no jobs and all of that. You know, it's just going to be a country whose only jobs are low-paying people taking care of old people who are broke. I mean, we're, we're headed down the tubes with all of this. There's no doubt about it. I'll probably be dead by the time it hits. But I might, not, I might actually still be alive when all this finally comes to a head. As a result, massive explosions of vehicle miles traveled, congestion, emissions, all those outcomes. Um, there will need to be some other kind of adjustment. Any questions or comments about them? I'm going through some fairly controversial stuff, so I hope some people want to. Comment when, on your last point. Another function of the operator on the bus is that it's a, a presence of an agency representative. Yeah, who's going to collect and fares? I who's going to watch there behavior? Are a lot of people out there who are concerned that transit is not safe. And of course, <laughs> it the isn't actually. just really add to that perception. But if we were to go to driverless buses, there is no... There isn't going to be any driverless cars or any driverless buses. There'll be, there's, there's some small experimental things happening. 
but it, this is not going to be happening anytime soon. So this, this conversation is really way ahead of itself. It's, they're not being. There's a few. There's a few places where they're using them. They can't be run on a massive level. First of all, they can't produce them on a massive level. And second of all, it's I, you know I I uh, I know that this isn't going to be happening for at least for the next fifty years. So I, I'm not sure why everybody's so fixated on this right now. Authority on the bus, and I think that would just exacerbate that perception. The experience—that is something where the experience of driverless trains, I think, is relevant because they do exist. I used to live in Vancouver. I rode the, those trains every day. And what? And yes, there's a, a bad story about something happening on a train every once in a while, as 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 you would expect. And in most of these cases, having a driver wouldn't have made much of a difference. What people figure out is that with the excellent communication systems on these bus on these buses and trains, you know, especially if you're a ways toward the back you know, or far away from the driver, you can get the dispatch center's attention before you can get the driver's attention. And ultimately, the dispatch center has a big picture view of exactly what's happening and can contact the driver, can contact the police, can contact the fire department, can figure out how to route things so that the disruption is minimized, um, can do all of that at least as efficiently as the driver can. Um, and so this is one of those things where that really feels uncomfortable. It feels uncomfortable to me. But it is something that, over the course of a decade or so, a community gets used to. Uh, so long as the actual statistics are showing, as they certainly do in Vancouver, that it wouldn't be any safer, really, to have a driver on the train. Um, any other questions or comments about this? Yeah, I think the uh, kind of touching on what Neil brought up earlier, well, one of the things I hear a lot from you know the public I talk to them about is, you know, I want more parking rides. Right. We need more parking parking rides. Pork and rides. I and I've always thought there's an opportunity <laughs> for this type of uh, career technocrat know, demand response. Spent his whole life the Uber as a city manager. Like the small uh, ten thousand a month public pension. Type of, uh, uh, innovative vehicle we saw in Montreal, where you could have people, you know, have that circulate around, some, especially some of the lower density developments within a radius of a of a of a major transit stop, pick up people and bring them to that because my belief is once people are in their cars, they're more likely to stay in their cars. Right. And so if we can get them, you know, it's either obviously providing the service through more fixed routes close to their homes or something like this that could, you know, get 20 people to a, a bus stop or a transit center at one time. So any thoughts about the future that way? So there are two different ways to think about that. One is, of course, at some point, if you, as long as you provide space at the facility, um, good on the good for the private sector to do that anyway. You know, at a cost that's reasonable for them, which is going to cost much more than your transit fare. If you decide you want to subsidize that to bring that cost down somewhat, that will get very expensive for you. I mean, if you want to take it all the way down so that it's as cheap as a bus fare, I think you'll find that just staggeringly expensive compared to just running a fixed round bus. So, so just to put this in perspective, here we're talking about we're talking about Happy Valley. I'm thinking of Cedar Mill in your part of the world, right? Low density, semi-rural, mostly pretty affluent, lots of people who, you know, but who also hate driving into the into Portland through the through the minimal number of options for doing that and are perfectly happy to just get down to Sunset Transit Center and get on the train. Great. And and you can't expand park and ride very much. It's fantastically expensive. So it's great that you have alternatives to that. And there may be deals where, okay, we see our interest in getting more people to the train without having to park more cars at the station. These companies are out there wanting to do it. It's not going to be as efficient as this, as you know our little Cedar Mill bus, inefficient as that is. Um, so it's got to be more expensive, but you know maybe there's a sweet spot in there. You know, maybe your subsidy is in the form of just providing ample space at the transit center, or maybe there's a little bit more. That can be figured out, um, and it certainly has potential. I'm going to notice on the peak, at the peak of the peak. Because the one thing to remember about the peak is that peaks, pulling out a bus just for the peak is so expensive 
that it's actually okay to, can be okay to lose a few riders to these things if you would otherwise have to pull out even more service. Yeah. In my experience, technology doesn't necessarily reduce cost. Mm -hmm. So let's say we have a rider, uh, a driverless bus or a driverless train. Right. Then we need to shift that cost into another area of the organization that gets into the monitoring aspect right. that you talked about. So it, it doesn't really drive costs down necessarily. <laughs> it changes the structure of cost a little bit <clears throat> because as long as you have a driver on each vehicle, that's an absolute rigid boundary on how much service you can run, right? Once you, what you're doing is monitoring, the relationship to quality of service is a little softer. Yes, generally, you know, the more service you run, the more monitoring you're gonna have, but it's not the sort of absolute one-for-one -one law that we have as long as we have a, a, a driver on each vehicle. He <laughs> sounds like he's snorting cocaine. Um, yeah, that's the whole light rail. <coughs> oh, God. That's a whole light rail argument. You have one driver for uh, 200 people, whereas you, a bus, you have one driver for 40 people. That's the whole, that's, once again, we're neoliberalism, where everything is decided in terms of cost, rather than having every <laughs> everything provided properly, because that's how it should be done, and not worry about, you know, with the kind of taxes that we Americans pay, you know, we don't have anything good in this country. We don't have single-payer health care, which all Western democracies have except us. We don't have decent public transportation, which all Western democracies and Asians have, and we don't get that. And this is this is part of that whole deal is that in this country, people are are looked at as a commodity more or less. We're we're commodified, and this this whole presentation kind of is showing me the commodification of human beings as it regards to public transportation. Now I know he's telling the story that every this public transportation industrial complex clicks, thinks like him. Okay, this guy is very uh, influential and my whole shtick is to change the industrial complex completely from top to bottom which will never happen, of course, because we the citizens have no power in this area. And all these people sitting at this table and this desk and on him, these are all six-figure people. They're all part of the elites. They're not us. They're the elites. And they're making all the decisions for us. And there's not one bus driver here, and there's not one transit-dependent rider who's actually middle class or poor. See, these people here make all the decisions for all the rest of us that are not part of their class. And that's the problem. And it's never going to be any good as long as this is the type of system that we have to work with. <laughs>